Praise to His the Dalai Lama as Skull Chakra. And so you were born in Tibet. And your speech, your teaching has spread all over the world, and your compassion encompasses all beings. We bow to you, Tenzin Gyatso, Your Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Yes, we are debating on Tibetan grammar. The text on grammar that is believed to have written by Thami Sambhata, the first grammar book, which is called Sumchupa. Why is it called the 30 or 30 verses? It's because it is the first text that is written in Tibetan on Tibetan grammar. And there are four objects of praise in this text. To the three jewels, to the Lama, to Ishwara. So the first two verses are homage to the three jewels. I bow to the three jewels who possess the excellent, most excellent qualities. And then the second and the next two the second the next two lines is a praise to Manjushri. And then the next two lines are said to be prayer, praise or homage to Shiva, who is the originator of the basis of letters. And then the fourth homage is made to the Lama. What is the definition of letters or yige akshar? It is the basis on which we compose names and words and within this alphabet we have the vowels we have the vowels and uh, the alphabet uh, we have the consonants and vowels So this is a debate whether R, the letter R, is a vowel or not, and these people are trying to prove that it is by quoting from Yangjin Dubey Daoji, who has written a 
text on grammar and also shallow lots of watch. Lord the Chui Kyung. And Sai Japan Dita also says that the R is our letter R is a vowel. So if you don't accept R to be a vowel, uh, to, uh, to be a vowel, as Yang Chin Dube Doji says, so he's interpreting Yang Jin Dube Doji to say that if we uh, accept five vowels, uh, e, u, e, e, o, and R, then it's convenient, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to accept five vowels. Yeah, <laughs> So your answer was that it is convenient to have R as a vowel because you said the, both the vowels and consonants have that uh, the sound of R uh, at the end. Uh, they are trying to say that R uh, is a vowel because it is so this is uh, this dedication prayers for the long life of his holiness and also for the development and cultivation of bodhicitta. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
I bow to my guru and guardian, the ennobling, impeccable Manjushri, who is into your intelligence clearly shines forth like the sun, free from the clouds. <coughs> Homage to the perfection of mother, wisdom, the mother of all Buddhas of the three times, which is beyond words, inconceivable, inexpressible, unproduced and unobstructed. It is nature in the nature of space, the object of domain of the self-awareness wisdom. Then the verse of salutation from Abhisamaya Lankara, ornament for the realization through the knowledge of all the Shravakas. Seeking peace are led to true peace through the knowledge of the power of those intending to benefit transmigrating beings, fulfill the aims of the world. Being perfectly endowed with the omniscient mind, the Munis or sages, the Buddhas give various teachings with all kinds of aspects. I bow down to the mother of the Buddhas together with the communities of hearers and bodhisattvas. And then the wisdom, salutation verse from the Middle Way treatise called Wisdom. I prostrate to the perfect Buddha, the best of all teachers, who taught that that which arises through dependent relationship is without cessation, without arising, without annihilation, without permanence, without coming, without going, and without distinction, without identity, and peaceful, free from fabrications. <laughs> This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Mero, the four continents. The sun and the moon. I visualize. as a Buddha filled and offer it to you. To the Buddha, Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly, I seek refuge until I'm enlightened. Wherever merit and wisdom I gain through listening to the teaching, I may I become through that, may I become 
Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings to the Dharma, to the Buddha Dharma and Supreme Assembly, I seek refuge until I'm enlightened. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened. Whatever merit and wisdom I gain to listen to the teaching, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. So today, though we are exiles, but everyone here, young and old, are taking interest in education. So here we had uh, people, students uh, debating, who debated. <coughs> which is an, an indication there of their constant interest in the study of <coughs> in their education. So this debate is not something which is done by everyone. Uh, in the monastic institutions where they have study of philosophy and uh, logic, they do uh, this kind of debate. But here we have younger generations taking interest in uh, debate, <coughs> dialectical debate. So in Tibet, Buddhism, and particularly the Nalan tradition has spread, and we have the tradition of debate, which is Nalanda tradition. So inside Tibet also, in the monastic institutions like Sera, Gadepong, and so forth. They have the uh, tradition of debate as part of their study curriculum, whereas the lay people didn't have this kind of uh, means of uh, pursuing the study of Buddhism. But after coming into exile, Everyone, young and old, lay people, the monastics, have started taking interest in debate, which is a very good uh, practice. So Tibetan spirituality and culture is not just about preservation of the, uh, it, but we are able to show it to the world at large. So right from the beginning of our traditional study, we, when we, st we study, we uh, study start with the uh, start with the collected topics, and then go on with the rest of the studies, which is very beneficial. So the students of the schools also are getting into the habit of the, uh, using debate as part of their study curriculum, which is very good. So this is, this is how we preserve our, uh, preserve and protect our spirituality, spiritual tradition and culture. So you are all involved in this. So we are only few in number in exile, but this tradition of debate that we have, so it can also be spread to uh, China proper as well. We have to keep this in mind. And uh, in the past, Chinese people have uh, 
joined our monastic institutions. Very few of them were there in the past, but now, today, there is an increasing number of Chinese um, <coughs> who take interest in the study of Buddhism. So we need to keep in mind how we could serve them and to uh, spread this tradition in China proper. So though uh, we are living in exile, but Tibetan heritage, its religion and culture has become something which the people world over have taken interest in. And so we are having making a good stride in the spread of this tradition that we have inside Tibet, inside China. <clears throat> there is great increasing interest in, uh, people are increasingly taking more interest in the study of Buddha Dharma and, and also in other parts of the world. Uh, it's the same. Therefore, it's very important for us to keep up with this tradition of debate, the dialectical debate, so we can become their role models. <coughs> so it's not uh, our tradition to show that our tradition is not uh, only about prayers and rituals, but uh, in-depth study of Buddhist philosophy through logical uh, process and debate. <coughs> so amongst us exiles, <coughs> through this kind of debate, <coughs> If we could keep up with our <coughs> effort in preserving and promoting the Buddhist culture and tradition, we could help Chinese in China proper to also uh, take up this uh, tradition so that they can preserve the Dharma through both study and practice. <coughs> so there is an indication, I think, that in China proper also, people would take up this uh, tradition of debate uh, to study Buddhism and its philosophy. So, with regard to that, we may be able to make contribution to the Chinese communities through our own example. So, therefore, if we could expand this tradition of debate, in the study of Buddhist philosophy and logic, it would be helpful and beneficial to them. And then there are people in other parts of the world where Buddhism didn't used to be a traditional religion. And therefore, if we could also try to spread this tradition of debate <coughs> to them as well, it would be very beneficial. So this tradition that we are talking about has come from the Nalanda monastic institution of ancient India. So that people are able to also take uh, interest in this tradition. And this is our responsibility to be able to contribute to the world through our uh, spirituality and cultural tradition uh, and, and the debate that the children, the presented was very good. I appreciate it. 
In the past, Tibetans may not have appreci uh, may not have appreciated this kind of uh, school children debating. In the worst case scenario, they may people may even spit at the children for debating, but that's not happening. So this tradition of Buddhism that we have, that we have kept, is now being taught in the schools so that young children become uh, accustomed to it. Yeah. This is a blessing or grace for the tea. I Though I am quite uh, old now, I have not lost even a single tooth. So I can. Amongst the different, many different refugees, exiles in in the world today, Tibetan seems to be the most successful uh, people, and we have done our best to keep up with our tradition, heritage, and we should still uh, feel determined to keep up with our spiritual and uh, the traditions. So, even as a child, I used to take lots of candies, but I have not lost even a single tooth, uh, tooth till now. Therefore, I can bite on bread like this. <laughs> so I dreamt of Baldenhamu, the Dharma protector goddess, sitting on my neck. <laughs> and prophesied to me that I would live uh, to be a hundred and ten. So I had this kind of very uh, vivid dream. So just as it was prophesied in the dream, my physical condition also from my physical condition, I can see that I may live to be 110 or so. The most important thing is to, to have a strong bond of spiritual bond between us, keeping our faith, our commitment, and the spiritual bond firm. So I, I generate right from the beginning of uh, my day, as soon as I wake up, I pray for everyone. So therefore, you should, uh, for everyone, particularly Tibetans, and uh, therefore you should feel at ease. See. So as Nagarjuna sees in his precious garland, just going up a little bit, the person is not earth, not water, not fire, not wind, not space, not consciousness. If not them all, what else is a person? And then further with respect to the statement, I'm, I saw Lucky, but Lucky's body seeing merely the external skin <coughs> from among the many parts of the body, flesh, skin, bones, and so forth, and functions as seeing his body. Even if the body, blood, blood 
bones and so forth are not seen. It does not mean that the body is not seen. To see a body, it is not necessary to see all the body, all of the body. Seeing even a small part can function as seeing the body. However, sometimes by the force of general custom, <coughs> if a certain amount is not seen, if it cannot function as seeing the, of the body, as above, if the body is divided into its individual parts, legs, arms, and so on. So if the body is made up of these different parts, like our legs, hands, and <coughs> torso, and so forth. But if you try to say, try to pinpoint the body, I mean, you will not be able to do that. Of course, the body is made up of all these different parts, the head, the legs, hands, torso, and so forth. So the body is a composite of all these parts that are put that, uh, together, and therefore the composite of the different parts on the basis of that, then we make the, uh, we give the label body, and then we have a body. And then on a larger scale, the world is a composite of many different factors that have come together on the basis of which we give the label the world or the earth. So there is no earth apart from these different composite parts. And as in the Madhyamaka tradition, uh, say it says that things are dependently designated. Whereas if you try to pinpoint a thing, to, uh, you cannot do that without the parts. So we give certain label to things on the basis of its different parts coming together in a certain fashion, and then that functions as that thing, otherwise not. So through that labeling, designation, things uh, conventionally work for us. So again, the person is neither the earth, water, nor fire, nor wind, nor space, nor consciousness. If not them all, what else is a person? So what is a person, if you are asked? A person is someone who is labeled on the basis of his or her mind and body components that have come together. So apart from the mind and body composite factors coming together and being labeled as a person, there is no person as such. So of course we have the sense of uh, I am and then together with that I am, you have also a notion of a self which is independent from the body and mind. But there is no such a self. So therefore it is un important for us to understand what is taught in the classic texts. So of course you have to do this analysis into yourself. Where am I? Who am I? From your crown of your head down to the tip of your toes. Where is the person? Of course, when you try to dissect yourself into different parts, whether it's a body or the mind, you cannot find the person as such. But that doesn't mean the person does not exist. The person exists only by way of designation on the basis of the different parts, the different component factors that have come together. Therefore, it is important to understand, keep in mind the fact that the body, on the basis of the body and the mind coming together, you are labeled as a person, as this or that. 
so dependently designated nature of yourself. To understand that is very important. So whatever things appear to our mind, they appear as if they have some kind of a fixated ent entity or nature. But things do not exist that way. It is very clear that things things do not have any essential existence in and of themselves. Take the example of myself. When I meditate on emptiness, of course, I do. Uh, I do meditate on emptiness on a daily basis. So, apart from being designated, dependently designated on the basis of the different parts I am labeled. So what that helps is to understand that helps is to, to loosen that grip on yourself as if you are some kind of a concretely existing entity. So maybe so today we are all delightfully gathered here. So I wish to do a Bodhisattva <coughs> ceremony for Bodhisattva vows. So these are all the things that maybe we don't need to uh, read through the text, the key to the middle way. It's not necessary to do the transmission, reading transmission of the text, the whole text. So His Holiness wishes to do the Bodhisattva vows. So, Bodhisattva, bearing a good heart, warm heartedness is very important for our happiness. It is the, the source of our happiness. So, you should feel determined to practice compassion in order to help and serve sentient beings and also feel determined to uh, have the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas as your, as your witness to make this determination to have a warm heart within yourself with which you would serve and benefit other sentient beings. So I do generate or cultivate good heart, warm heartedness for the be benefit of all sentient beings. And that is very helpful for my peace of mind to bring peace within myself. And so that, that uh, gives a relaxed state of mind, brings a relaxed state of mind. And that in turn is very helpful for my physical health as well. So naturally, I feel um, peace within, peace of mind, peaceful mind within myself. And therefore, let's do this. Um, so I'm like a spokesperson for of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and. Imagine the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in the space before you. <clears throat> so, and then reflect that you are born in a place where the Buddha Dharma, the teaching of the Buddha, has spread and is alive. And also feel determined that I will generate this resolute, good heart for the benefit of all sentient beings and also 
make this determination that I will be an example for the people around me to have a good heart, a warm heart. So, and then do your best. So as soon as I wake up, I think along these lines, in order to fulfill the aims of oneself and others, I shall generate the spirit of enlightenment. And so, this gives me peaceful state of mind. It's like a tranquilizer. So when you have bodhicitta, the spirit of enlightenment, you have a relaxed state of mind, calm state of mind, and that in turn balances the, the physical elements within myself, the different humors within myself, and uh, therefore I can feel physical, good physical health as well. So let us uh, so I'll be like the chant master leading the ceremony for you. And you should imagine all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas sitting before you <coughs> in the space. <coughs> so I have this good uh, determination to have a good heart for the benefit of all sentient beings. I go for refuge and I'm enlightened to the Buddha Dharma and the Supreme Assembly, and I do so to attain enlightened mind in order to fulfill the aims of myself and my, my others. I should develop a supreme enlightened motive, and toward all sentient beings and my invited guests, I shall interact with supreme enlightened contact. Uh, may I become a Buddha, become a Buddha to benefit all. I go for refuge to the three jewels. I confess individually my all negativities. I rejoice in the virtues of my creating beings. I hold with my mind in Buddha's enlightenment. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. I do so to attain enlightened mind. In order to fulfill the aims of myself and others, I shall develop a supreme enlightened motive, and toward all sentient beings, my invited guests, I shall act with supreme enlightened conduct. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. So we have done it two times. Let us recite it for the repeated for the third time and make this determination and pledge that I will uh, generate bodhicitta for the benefit of all sentient beings. I go for refuge to, to the three jewels. I confess individually all my negativities. I rejoice in the virtues of all beings. I hold with my mind a Buddha's enlightenment. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha Dharma and Supreme Assembly and do so to attain an enlightened mind in order to fulfill the aims of myself and others. I shall develop a supreme enlightened motive and towards all sentient beings, my invited guests, I act. Uh, I shall act with supreme enlightened conduct. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. <coughs> So with that, we are done with the Bodhisattva, Bodhicitta ceremony. So I, I do reflect on this uh, Bodhicitta daily. This is the best kind of medicine or tranquilizer for peace, for bringing peace of mind. So, my Dharma friends, keep this bodhicitta ceremony in your mind. 
and bodhicitta in your mind daily. And if you do certain ritual for bodhisattva vow, bodhicitta uh, ceremony, then you should do the by using these lines or others for cultivating bodhicitta. <clears throat> May the precious sublime bodhicitta arise where it has not yet been born, where it has arisen, may it never decline, but increase more and more. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, <laughs> adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it to you. May all sentient beings enjoy the pure field. circled by fans of snow mountains you are the source of all good and happiness Lord of Alakiteshwara, may you live until the space, until the samsara, this, uh, this vicious cycle of birth and death comes to an end. This is a prayer of the true words by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. You whose glory is an ocean of immeasurable qualities and you who look upon a poor beings as if they were your only child, Sugatas of the past, present, future, Bodhisattvas and your disciples, pray heed these lamentations of truth. May the entire teaching of the Buddha, which dispel all the torments of existence and peace, spread to benefit the whole wide world with help and happiness. May those who hold them, scholars and practitioners, flourish in their practice of the ten activities of the Dharma. Utterly oppressed by the intolerable intensity of their negative actions, deprived beings are tortured by interminable suffering, pacify their unbearable diseases, wars and famines, and bring them the succor of infinite joy and well-being. In particular, the people of Tibet, inheritors of the Dharma, are being destroyed by the many evils of the barbarian horde. Malevolent and heartless, in a river of blood and tears, arouse the force of com compassion that the atonement may swiftly be stopped. Those hosts of savage oppressors, cruelly crazed by their own demonic passions, who bring ruin, ruin, on both others and themselves, deserve our compassion. May they develop a complete vision of right and wrong and appreciate the benefits of loving care and friendship. 
Since a long time ago, the wish most dear to my heart has been for all of Tibet to enjoy freedom in a natural combination of spiritual and secular spheres. Ground that I may soon have the fortune to take part in that celebration. <coughs> And then at the end, may whatever is undertaken by those malevolent beings, be they visible or invisible, to do who, due to their perverse aspirations in the past, are hostile to the Buddha's teaching, be uprooted by the truth of the three jewels.